Now, Evan remembers the role of Churchill and Roosevelt throughout the war, but there was a third man key to their relationship, and of the three of them, the only one to remain in power at the end of war in August 45. Mackenzie King was the Prime Minister of Canada, the largest British Dominion and America's closest ally. By the start of the war, King knew both FDR and he'd been friends with Churchill since first meeting him in 1905. King would serve as the linchpin between the great powers, yet he's now often overlooked. Joining me is Neville Thompson. Neville is a Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Western Ontario, where he taught British and European history. He's also the author of the wonderful book, The Third Man, Churchill, Roosevelt, Mackenzie King and the Untold Friendships that Won World War II, which recounts the relationship between the three men based on King's personal diaries. But before we get started... It's a big thank you to all those who support the podcast by becoming patrons. A dollar or so from a listener like you helps me find the time to put the show together. You can find out more at patreon.com forward slash ww2podcast. I really do value your support and when possible I do try to make extra bits and bobs uh, available exclusive for patrons. A bit more World War II chat as it were. So that's patreon.com forward slash ww2podcasts. Right, on to the main feature. Neville, thanks for joining me. Um, let's start with King. For people who don't know him, what's his background um, before the Second World War? Because like uh, Churchill and FDR, he was in politics for a, a very long time. He'd, he'd really been in politics for the, from the beginning of the century. He began as a young civil servant, uh, but in Canada in those days, uh, the civil service was pretty heavily politicised. He was uh, patronised uh, by a liberal uh, minister. And then in the first decade of the 20th century, he became briefly cabinet minister, minister of labour, but only briefly because the government was defeated. Uh, then he was out of politics from 1911, uh, really to uh, 1921, when he became the liberal leader. But he never lost touch with politics. He was always very much involved in it, not formally. Uh, So he was liberal leader from 1921 to 1948, which was longer than anyone at that time, longer than Sir Robert Walpole, and so which is an astonishing achievement. He was out of office for only five years, uh, from 1930 to 1935, which is a kind of blessing, because almost anybody who was in office in the early 1930s was voted out, except, of course, in Britain, the national government, because that was a coalition of uh, most of the uh, leading politicians. <laughs> but apart from that, uh, it was out. I mean, if, if it hadn't been for the Depression, I mean, it's quite likely that uh, Hoover would have been reelected in 1932, for example, and so on. So, so in, in that sense, King was lucky. So, so he was uh, an old political hand uh, by, say, 1939, the beginning of the war, in this, exactly the same way that Churchill was, because Churchill got into the House of Commons in 1900. King and, uh, uh, and Churchill met in Ottawa. Uh, when uh, Churchill was on a lecture tour of North America, speaking about his experiences in the Boer War. They were exactly the same age, just two years, uh, two weeks uh, difference in age. So they'd known each other by the Second World War for a long time. That didn't mean that they'd been close friends some of the time. Some of the time they had been, they were young liberals to start with, and they differed on things and so on. But they'd known each other for a long time. Roosevelt, King had known only since 1935, but even that was a fairly long time when he was re-elected as prime minister, uh, and they knew each other very well. So what this meant was that by 1939, King was the person who knew Roosevelt and Churchill better than anyone else in any third country. Uh, he knew them better than, far better than they knew themselves. Roosevelt and Churchill had met only once, very briefly, in 1918, when Roosevelt considered that Churchill had uh, snubbed him and so on. So they didn't really meet until the Atlantic Conference in August 1941, when they got to know each other. When the United States got into the war after Pearl Harbor, then, of course, they got to know each other very well. Uh, Churchill went over to the U.S., uh, stayed at the White House for the best part of the uh, month. And they got to know each other well. But before that, the person who was the intermediary between them was King. He was the only person who knew them well. And this was especially crucial in 1940, 1941, when it seemed 
but Britain might well be invaded, might even be defeated. Uh, the Royal Navy might be lost to the Germans, which would mean a combination which could perhaps overwhelm the United States if it chose to and so on. So his moment, if you want to put it that way, his most crucial moment in this relationship was undoubtedly 1940, 1941. It was important before, it was important afterwards, but that was the really crucial moment. That pre-war relationship with King, with Churchill, so King and Churchill, I find absolutely intriguing because, so the first meeting was 1905, isn't it? So they really do know, they, and they, it's their way they can like, pass like ships in the night after that. They, they, you know, they bump into one another, they have dinner together, and they're, they're kind of like old friends who are not quite old friends who... Yes. Well, partly, it's, of course, it's physical distance. Uh, I mean, Canada was uh, a long way in the days of uh, ships. Uh, from Canada. Uh, Churchill came to Canada in 1929 and 1931. King went to England uh, and saw Churchill there uh, more frequently, but it was only every few years that they saw each other. But it was a relationship that they could pick up, like childhood friendship and so on. Even if you don't see the person for a long time, you can pick it up again. Uh, you're on a, a common wavelength, even when you're disagreeing on things, uh, which King and Churchill did very much in the 1920s and 1930s. They were still friends. And, and King admired Churchill. He knew that there was something extraordinary in that personality. I mean, didn't always necessarily approve of it, but there was something exceptional. This was not an ordinary person, for good or ill. So, so when you know Churchill takes you know quite a, a you know, anti appeasement stamp uh, at stand, where does what you know in those thirties, you with the appeasement bubbling away? Where does King stand? Uh, pre-war. Is he pro appeasement or does he fall with Chil Churchill's belligerent tone? He, he is absolutely in favour of appeasement, which seems a shameful thing now. Uh, but from King's point of view, and he wasn't alone in this, uh, in Canada or anywhere else, he was desperate to avoid another war like the First World War, which was less than 20 years in the past, which had taken a tremendous toll on Canada, been bitterly divided on conscription, socially, politically, culturally. And it was King who sort of bound up the wounds in the 1920s. He did not want another terrible war. He was not alone in that. Most people uh, felt the same. Roosevelt felt the same. Jan Smuts in South Africa felt exactly the same. Robert Menzies in Australia, exactly the same. It was Churchill that was the exception. And of course, that was the basis of Churchill's greatness, wasn't it? I mean, everybody's forgotten about his opposition uh, to uh, self-government for India in the 1930s. But they remember, and rightly so, that he was right to suspect that Hitler did not just want to put together the Germans in Europe. His ambitions went well beyond this. But this was not uh, entirely clear until March 1939, when Hitler for the first time annexed non-German areas, that is to say the Czech part of Czechoslovakia and so on. And then the sort of blinkers fell from a lot of eyes. Attitudes changed and so on. And Churchill was vindicated and so on. But even then, King, I have to say, uh, still continued to hope that somehow something could be patched up uh, and so on, that there would not be war. War, he thought, would be devastating. And indeed, it was devastating. But the calculation that most people would make now was that terrible as it was, it was still worth it to defeat uh, Nazi Germany and in the Far East, uh, Japan, which is not very much different. Italy, perhaps a minor sort of matter and so on. That was less important uh, you know, for being, you know, pro appeasement, you know, anti war, however you want to put it, he King does privately assure the British in is it nineteen thirty seven that in the event of war he would support Britain. Yes. I wondered why he felt the need to back Britain so strongly, because you know, in some respects you might say that's encouraging Britain to uh <laughs> to take a belligerent stance. It it didn't it didn't encourage Britain to take a firm stand because they weren't sure on what terms Canada or any other dominion would side with it. This really goes uh, to uh, the heart of King's 
idea of the Commonwealth. And his idea of the Commonwealth, which he, and he got his way, was expressed in the Statute of Westminster in 1931, was that these were independent, self-governing countries. But on the other hand, King felt very strongly that he was an imperialist in the sense of a member of the empire. He didn't like the term Commonwealth, but he was a member of the empire. And that if Britain was in danger, Canada would fight for Britain in the same way that Britain would fight for Canada or Australia would fight uh, for Canada or Canada would fight for New Zealand. So the Commonwealth then, in his view, uh, was a a group of self-governing dominions, uh, but who were bound together by a common culture, political system, legal system, and so on. And if they were in danger in a good cause, they would fight for each other. This does not mean that King, say, would fight uh, to uh, keep colonies uh, in the Pacific. But if Britain were uh, attacked, then he would fight for the defense of Britain, as he expected that Britain would go to war for Canada if it were threatened, or as I say, New Zealand and so on. Ireland, which was technically a dominion, is out of the question because in practice, Ireland was an independent country by 1938, and as you know, remained independent uh, through the Second World War. So I leave it out of the calculation uh, that I'm making in this. How did King expect, if war came, to, to help Britain? I mean, did he envisage sending over vast amounts of troops or because you know, that that in itself is a problem for Canada you know the problems with conscription you presumably want to avoid I, I, I don't think he knew exactly what the war was going to be and indeed nobody really knew the nature of the war in 1939 because although Britain declared war and carried along with it the, the fighting was in Poland. Canada did send a division, of course, at the end of 1939 uh, for the defense of uh, Britain. But what more would be required, it was difficult to know. The war was really at sea, and there the Royal Navy could handle it. It's it's for this reason that King's admiration for Churchill began to soar, for two reasons. One, that he was fighting a pretty successful war against the German Navy as head of the Admiralty. And secondly, his uh, great morale raising speeches. So King's opinion then of Churchill went up through what we call the the phony war uh, and so on. Though even when Churchill became prime minister on the 10th of May, 1940, King was, and Roosevelt too, were sort of hesitant because they were afraid that he was such a heavy drinker uh, and and had a a reputation for being erratic that it, it might not be a good choice. But within a couple of weeks, they were both of them convinced this was the man. This was the man. <laughs> what abused me is that uh, King gives up drinking for the duration of the war, doesn't he? he, he well, yeah, King was to- King was never much of a drinker. He didn't he <laughs> didn't smoke. Uh, he drank only very lightly, and he gave up drink uh, for the Second World War, and would only on very rare occasions. Uh, take a drink, something celebratory. For example, when (laughs) he and President Roosevelt went to have dinner with uh, Princess Martha, who was a great favorite of uh, of, uh, Roosevelt, who spent the war just outside Washington and so on, he took a little Norwegian uh, wine. He would occasionally take a little glass on very, very special occasions. But (laughs) but he was just astonished. And indeed, everybody has to be astonished at the quantity of liquor that Churchill could take in and still function. I mean, Roosevelt, I have it somewhere in the book. I can't remember exactly where it was, where where Roosevelt says to Churchill, or says to King, how can Churchill drink so much till the middle of the night and yet get up in the morning and be as fresh as a daisy? And so Roosevelt couldn't understand it. I mean, Churchill in some sense was a functioning alcoholic. He was a heavy drinker, but it didn't seem to affect his judgment and so on. But it may have been one of the reasons, his heavy drinking, why he always insisted that people should never accept orders from him unless they were in writing. In other words, he himself perhaps realized that he might make some off-the-cuff It'll, it'll consider remarks three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> he had a lot to drink, but it was astonishing. This constitution, I mean, yet Churchill had lots of health problems in the Second World War, but he bounced back from it. And, and Roosevelt and, and, and King were just astounded at this, as indeed was everybody else. <laughs> 
I've never been quite convinced that, that Churchill, the, the part of his uh, strength was that uh, he surrounds himself with strong people against him who will stand up to him. And I think that's part of his strength that he, he wanted people to say no to him. Yes. To stop his stupid ideas. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, it was one of his great strengths. He did not want to be surrounded by Yes, man. And the great example of that, of course, is Alan Brooke, uh, who was the uh, head of the army for most of the Second World War. I mean, Brooke stood up to him <laughs> fearlessly, even though sometimes it was a madhouse. But Churchill didn't hesitate to surround himself by strong people. And that's greatly to his credit. Canada enters the war very quickly after Britain. Uh, is, it, is it a week later Canada declares war? Uh, yes, yes. Yes. I mean, it was clear that Canada was going to war. Uh, the only question was exactly on what terms and so on. King King had a, a good majority. He had Parliament under control. This, this was going to happen. There was no. But, but he wanted Parliament to make a decision and he wanted to make it clear that they were going to war to defend Britain for the cause of freedom and there would be no overseas conscription, which was the big issue that, that torn the country apart at, in, uh, at the end of the uh, sec- uh, First World War. Sorry. So is King leading public opinion or is he being led by public opinion? Well, that's a, that's a difficult question because in, in Canada at, at that time, uh, there were really basically two cultures, French, Canadian, largely in Quebec, though in some other places as well, and also British or English, uh, Canada, and so on. In the case of British Canada, he was following opinion. In the case of Quebec, he was leading it by giving this guarantee that there would not be conscription. On that basis, French Canada and his great uh, left lieutenant who spoke for the province would support going to war. So it, it's both. But even within English-speaking Canada, there were, there were divisions. Not everyone was in favor of going to war. I mean, there were many uh, immigrants from other countries, particularly before the First World War, from Eastern Europe, uh, who were, you know, Germans, Russians, Poles, Italians, uh, and on the West Coast, Japanese, all kinds of uh, people and so on. So in, in, in many ways, he was leading even that opinion of pulling it together for war. Because on, on the basis that he laid out uh, for Britain, for freedom, and no conscription. For, for overseas service, this would be voluntary. It's worth pointing out, by the way, that in Canada, this is always presented as though it's a unique Canadian issue. The only dominion in which there was conscription for overseas service was New Zealand. Australia had it, but only for the area around Australia. There could be no question of conscription in South Africa, where society, uh, European society, to say nothing of the blacks, was divided between the uh, British settlers and the Boers, who were at best neutral, in many ways pro-German. Even in Britain, there was not complete conscription. This was never extended to Northern Ireland. Churchill kept threatening to do this, but he never did. He did not want a civil war on his hands in Northern Ireland. I mean, he remembered well the First World War when just the threat of uh, extending conscription to Ireland uh, had uh, produced the Easter Rebellion. So even in Britain, the, the, the Northern Ireland was, was exempt from conscription. Uh, so, so it was an issue for everyone, except New Zealand, except, tiny as it was. King seems to have effectively left the British to drive the war, run the war. Um, why? Why? You know, why is he not pushing for the Dominions to possibly have more say in the the, the, the running of the war? You know, they're they're providing troops and material and vast amounts of money. And and, and, that, and that's a great uh, basis for criticism within Canada, both at the time and now. And I, I think the answer is that he thought that the British uh, knew best. Uh, what they were doing. They had uh, sort of better expertise in this. And, and if you, th- you think about it, I mean, he's not wrong. I mean, the British had 9,000 representatives in Washington after Pearl Harbor, all the way from diplomats down to trade negotiators, military people, and so on. Canada couldn't mobilize that extent uh, of uh, expertise. It simply didn't have it. So he trusted in, in British 
leadership. Uh, the Canadian Armed Forces acted largely with the British in the Second World War. Uh, this is a story that's not very well told. I mean, there, there are many uh, good books on the Canadian military in the Second World War, but they're li- written mainly within a national frame of reference, rather than how was the Canadian Army or the Canadian Navy, uh, uh, including the escorts across the Atlantic and the Air Force, how was it acting with the British counterparts and so on. This is a kind of missing link, so to speak, that isn't there than it should be. Well, it's fascinating because King gets kind of problems being uh, in, it, 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 geographically where Canada is. You know, so the, 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 what I, the problem I found fascinating where tra- Canada is suffering a massive trade imbalance because it's exporting vast amounts to Britain, but it's importing from the US. Britain can't afford to pay for the goods, so the cash isn't coming one way. And that puts King at the centre of a problem where he has to keep producing the goods for Britain to keep fighting, but at the same time, the money's not coming in to pay for the goods, but he has to get it from... And it's a classic problem for King to solve, being that middleman, isn't it? The money did come in, because it came in from the United States, uh, which even before uh, it got in the war, but especially after it got in the war, when it first got in the war, desperately needed armaments from Canada, which was in a better position uh, to uh, produce them. And so the Americans made an agreement that they would buy the stuff for cash. And in a way, in a kind of simple way, this cash, much of it was recycled to Britain. In the course of the Second World War, uh, Canada gave Britain $4 billion worth of their credits for everything, food, ammunition, ships, uh, airplanes, and so on. What this amounts to in another way uh, was that they were selling stuff at about half price. If you, if you knock off this for a uh, boon, which is, which is a huge gift. I mean, Churchill was astonished and kept saying to King, I don't know how a small country of 11 odd million people can do this and so on. And King said, well, this is our contribution to the great cause of uh, freedom. Again, there's a book waiting to be written. That's how this, this sort of money circulated around in this uh, Atlantic uh, triangle. I don't have the uh, economic competence uh, to do it, but I don't know of any book that, that actually does it either, and so on, even a technical book and so on. Uh, so, but, but Canada was in, enormously generous, if I may say so as a Canadian, in giving stuff uh, to Britain. And as I say, Churchill kept saying over and over again, thank you very much. Roosevelt didn't say so much, even though Canada supplied stuff to the United States, because the United States was uh, paying for this in hard cash. The United States, in fact, was giving a tremendous benefit to Canada. Of course, it was getting something for it uh, as well. This this predates, or is Lend-Lease as well, doesn't it? So it's another way of Amer- America sh- shoving aid to Britain without officially supporting Britain. As you say, it's a wonderful economic sleight of hand. Yeah, and, 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 and of course, Roosevelt's argument is that even though the United States was neutral, it had to def- it had to support Britain because if Britain fell, which it seemed it might in the summer of 1940, in particular, if Britain fell, then the way would be open to the United States. And Roosevelt also expected an attack not just across the North Atlantic; he expected the Germans. And, he, and also the Japanese to establish bases in uh, South and Central uh, America from which they would also attack uh, the United States, which is one of the reasons that he wanted bases in the West Indies, as well as further north up towards uh, Bermuda and Newfoundland. How come Canada was the, f- the first country to declare war on Japan? Well, <laughs> that just happened to be a matter of time. <laughs> they- <laughs> It's only by a few hours. <laughs> I just said, yeah, um, I, know, I made a note of that. Right, all right. It, it was like, wow, that was, that was, yeah, that was quick off the you bat. You see, Ro- 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 Roosevelt had to go to Congress, uh, of course, the next day. Uh, but King argued that this was just an extension of the war against Germany uh, for uh, Britain. So he could just do it by ordering counsel. There was no need uh, to call Parliament to have anything of that kind. But it's still, it, it's an interesting sort of tidbit. It isn't it? It was the first country in the war. Not what you would expect. 
I, and it's yeah, because it, you, 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 the Canadian contribution to the Japanese War, the, the Pacific War, uh, is not as memorable as the Canadian contribution to Northwest no, Europe. And, and it, it was very small, except for two uh, areas. One was the defense of, uh, of Hong Kong, such as it was, of course, it soon fell. Uh, the other was the um, just the Aleutian Islands, to which Canada contributed uh, 5,000 troops. But this was a kind of non-event Anyway, because the Japanese had already uh, sort of evacuated the islands before the Canadian and uh, uh, U.S. forces uh, arrived. Uh, and also at the second uh, Quebec conference in 1944, uh, it was agreed by Roosevelt and uh, Churchill uh, that Canada would not play a big role in the war against the Pacific. This, of course, is part of a bigger story. The Americans were keeping the war against Japan to themselves. They didn't even want the British very much involved. It was all right for them to defend India. And so this was an American war, and they were, above all, not going to fight for British colonies. And they were afraid that if the Britain got a major war in the war, in the major part in the war against Japan, what they'd be fighting for was the recovery of British colonies, which the Americans intended to liberate. So, they, so the British then, you know, fought hard, but at Quebec, they did get... Roosevelt's agreement that they could have a major part in the war against uh, Japan. Canada, however, uh, was not going to have. It would just have a small role at uh, the end. King got this promise from both Churchill and uh, Roosevelt. And above all, he was concerned there would be no conscription for a war in the Pacific. He was not opposed to war against Japan, but he was not going to fight for British colonies. Again, this goes back to his concept of the Commonwealth. He would fight to defend Britain, but not uh, to Britain's dependent colonies. He was a strong supporter of self-government for India. He thought that India should have, and so should the other colonies. Perhaps not immediately. Uh, perhaps it would need a bit of transition. But in principle, he was in favor of them being given independence. So in that sense, he was sort of more towards the Americans than towards Churchill. I say towards Churchill because within Britain, there were many people who felt the same way, uh, not just in the Labour Party, also even in the Conservatives, which Churchill had been fighting in the early 1930s, who were strongly in favour of giving self-government at very least to India, something that had been promised in the First World War. Was King closer to Britain and probably Churchill than the other Dominion leaders during the war. I sort of got the feeling he was, but I mean, there's Jan Smuts there, who Churchill was thick as thieves with as well, wasn't he? Yeah, I, I think in many ways, uh, I mean, King and Churchill were quite close. It's fair to say, though, that, 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 that Churchill and Smuts were even closer. They were all friends from the First World War, and the <laughs> opponents from the uh, Boer War. Uh, and also, Smuts was a more military person than King. Uh, Churchill could talk about real military policy to uh, Smuts in a battlefield level in a way that he not could not to uh, King. Smuts, by the way, always wore a uniform in the Second World War because he was the commander-in-chief of uh, South Africa's armed forces. Much as Churchill, as Minister of uh, Defence, was in charge of Britain's uh, forces, uh, King was nothing of the sort. He, he never wore any military uniform. He never pretended to military uh, experience uh, or uh, knowledge or insight. So it, it's fair to say that in, in many ways, Churchill and Smuts were closer than Churchill and King. But King was certainly number two in the list. Uh, yeah, of uh, relationships. Well, the, the, uh, the Australians change premiership halfway through as well. Don't they have an election halfway through? So again, you get this consistency with King throughout the war, which goes a long way to consistency you know, in time of crisis. Um, now, you mentioned before... Um, Quebec. Uh, it's the, the number of conferences where uh, Roosevelt meets Churchill and then um, King's also is invited to attend, but then it, he's not invited to attend. Is that that's the way? It's kind of a strange relationship he has at some of these meetings. Yeah, that's right. The two Quebec conferences, 1943 and 1944. Uh, King was present uh, there in the Citadel, uh, where both uh, the, the old fort, 
where both uh, Churchill and Roosevelt uh, were staying, but he was not formally a participant in the conference. He was not invited to the meeting of the uh, chiefs of staff of the Americans and the uh, British, and neither were the uh, Canadian chiefs of the armed forces who were also there. So in that sense, he was not a member of the conference. This was at Roosevelt's insistence. Churchill in 1943, and presumably uh, also in 1944, was quite willing to in, uh, include uh, King. He wanted to uh, keep his uh, uh, goodwill, but it was Roosevelt who put his foot down and said, no, if Canada is involved, then we're going to have to involve every other uh, country as well. I mean, it's going to be an enormous uh, big conference. What he wanted to do is to keep the control of the war in the uh, West, in the uh, North Atlantic sphere, to himself, Churchill, and their chiefs of staff, and so on. That being said, I mean, King was there uh, throughout both of these conferences, 1943-1944, went to an uh, endless number of lunches and dinners with the two, all kinds of informal uh, conferences. So he learned all kinds of things, was told all kinds of things. He was a confidant of both of them, uh, both individually uh, and separately. And so he was involved in the conference, not formally, but informally. And what was what were these conferences anyway? They were notionally military meetings with the chiefs of staff, with the prime minister and president uh, uh, present, but they were above all uh, a way for the two Roosevelt and Churchill to get together, iron out all kinds of uh, disagreements say, on nuclear uh, research in 1943, on the war in Japan in 1944, and on these kind of informal uh, bases. King was very much involved. He was so. so, so in, in, I mean, he was he was the best informed person outside King and Roosevelt at those conferences and so on, not in a technical military sense, but in every other way. And they confided him in him because they liked him. He was an, an agreeable person. Uh, he was the head of a major uh, country, which is important uh, to both of them. And they were both convinced that he was going to uh, keep confidential, whatever they said. They had no sense, either of them. He was keeping a huge, detailed diary of everything they said, how they looked, what they did, and so on, which is an enormous boon to historians, not just historians of Canada, but to historians in the wider world. And I'm trying to draw attention to that in this uh, book. I mean, there are all kinds of things in there, and so on. I got the feeling that uh, perhaps, perhaps wrongly, that um, you know he's affable. He goes to, he's invited to Washington when Churchill's there. That that yeah, the, his path cross, crosses the, with them. Um, and I wondered if uh, FDR sort of partly draws him in to draw Canada closer, but at the same time, King's wary of of the United States, and actually he he's always trying to lean towards Britain as much as uh, he's tried to be coaxed into the American yes. sphere. I mean, he was very much pro-American in many ways. He'd been educated in the uh, United States. He'd lived there, liked it, uh, liked the society. But he was always, as you just said, wary that Canada was going to be absorbed economically and uh, culturally. And this was another part of his view of the Commonwealth. The attachment to Britain and to the other dominions uh, meant that there was another source of loyalty. So what he was doing was treading a very thin line between the United States, which is a powerful country, economically, culturally, every other way. I mean, you could hear the radio across the border easily enough. The American newspapers and magazines were all over Canada. It's a, a powerful force. Uh, so he's treading this line between the United States and Britain. Ideally, what he would have liked was all three of them to come together in some kind of Atlantic civilization, not one of them dominating the other. Perhaps even a common citizenship, which Churchill talked about from time to time. I mean, King was sort of uh, in, in favor of that, as long as it was a, a tripartite thing and not one dominating the other. I mean, this was not very likely uh, to happen. But he, he was using the Commonwealth and the British connection as a counterweight to the United States. Uh, I wonder when the American enters the war, if the language of the war changes, because it becomes very much driven by Washington and London. And so it becomes a, you know, a Anglo and American way of describing things. Does that mean that Canada 
probably the rest of the uh, Commonwealth doesn't get a mention uh, as making a significant contribution. Is that a problem for King? And he was often really annoyed uh, that uh, Churchill and Roosevelt sort of talked about this as, uh, as though they were running the war just by themselves and nobody else uh, was involved. But from time to time, I mean, they, they, they would make uh, uh, re- favorable references to Canada's own. But when it was ignored, uh, King got really annoyed. Uh, an example of when Churchill did make an important reference was in his speech to Congress in 1943 when King was in the uh, gallery and so on. Uh, and Churchill made a point because King was there probably of talking about Canada's contribution, but often the two of them uh, would just forget about it and so on. And this is a reflection of how the two of them, Roosevelt and Churchill, thought that they were running the war together. And that's why Roosevelt didn't want other countries involved, especially, of course, de Gaulle, on which there are many uh, books on that, keeping de Gaulle out until 19. 19- uh, 44. And they were even dreaming of running the world after the war in 1943. They were dreaming that what became the United Nations organization, it didn't have a name at that time, uh, but the organization that would run the world after the war, the world organization, they, of course, would be running it. Not directly they were running their own countries, but they would be telling the United Nations, so to speak, uh, what to do. And they had the bright idea that Mackenzie King would be the key person within this world organization, the front runner, the troubleshooter, alerting them uh, to when there was a danger of aggression. And this, again, tells you the high opinion that they had of King. He was the third man in the literal sense. He was not just the third man in the war. He was going to be the third man after the war in running the world, as they saw it. Of course, it didn't turn out that way. Roosevelt died. Churchill was defeated, uh, and the, their successors uh, didn't call on King in the same way. And also, the United Nations developed in a very different way, especially after about 1947, once India had uh, independence and uh, took a strong lead in the United Nations becoming an anti-imperial organization. So, but. In 1943, things looked very different. Nobody knew what the world was going to be like after the war. It always fascinates me how early they start talking about a post-war world, the Allies. What's King? Roosevelt view in particular. Well, yeah, uh, you know, it, it, there's sort of a, there's a sort of an acknowledgement they're going to win, even when they're not winning. Um, they knew they were going to win, you know. but but for Roosevelt, this talking about the war, even at the Atlantic Conference before the United States was in the war. He was talking about the post-war war because he remembered the end very well, the end of the First World War when he'd been the assistant uh, uh, secretary uh, for the uh, Navy. After the end of the war, then the Allies began to think how they were going to build a world organization. Roosevelt thought this was a great mistake. You should have at least the basis of an organization before the war ended. And that's why there was so much attention to this in 1943 and 1944. So just before the war ended, just after Roosevelt died, uh, the uh, allies, the United Nations, met in San Francisco to talk about this organization. But it had already been fairly well worked out. This was Roosevelt's idea. But if you could get this going before the end of the war, then it might work. If you left it till afterwards, it might never get off the ground. Like the League of Nations, it might be a failure from the beginning. Was How far was King from uh, Roosevelt's ideas of post-war world or even Churchill? He was in favour of the United States and Britain and the great powers, including of course, the Soviet Union, which was key to the thing. It didn't work out that way, but key to the thing. Plus China, which Churchill regarded as a basket case because it was fighting a civil war as much as a war against uh, Japan had to be carried along by the other allies. And then at the last moment, uh, the ter- of the, the uh, Yalta Conference uh, in January uh, 1945, Roosevelt agreed to France becoming a great power in a curious way, uh, because he said to Churchill, in effect, all right, all right, you can have France as a great power if you get off my back about uh, China. So there were five great powers, however defined. Uh, King was in favor of them sort of running the world for a transitionary, transitional period, but he didn't want them dominating 
the world in the way in which Roosevelt and Churchill were dreaming about or seemed to be dreaming about during the war. I mean, it's hard to tell. Just, I mean, a lot of these were late night conversations, of course, uh, all kinds of fantasy. And so, but he was not in favor uh, of a, some kind of strong organization dominating the world. Countries should be independent. Uh, they should make their own decisions about what they were uh, going to do. And that, that was a skepticism about the United Nations. He supported it. He went to the conference in 1945 in uh, San Francisco, but he was hesitant about building an organization which would dominate the world, not just be an organization to preserve the peace. Uh, as I say, within a couple of years of the establishment of the United Nations, it was clear that it was going in some other direction, not just from what was envisaged in San Francisco, but what Churchill and Roosevelt uh, had uh, expected. So King King was in favor of it, but he had hesitations, just as he had had hesitations about the League of Nations, in which he thought just by a majority vote of all kinds of countries, Canada and any other country would find itself going to war against a country it did not want to fight. He was ambivalent about it. That's perhaps the best way I can sum it up very briefly. But Canada did take a big lead in the League of Nations and the United Nations after 1947, mostly under Lester Pearson, as a kind of Agency for Freedom, Anti-Colonialism, uh, and so on. But by that time, King was on the way out. He, he was old, he was not very well, and he retired in 1948. That's, this is a story that goes long beyond, far beyond King. FDR dies, Churchill loses the election you mentioned in, uh, in that summer of 1945. Um, of What's King do, King's standing with the new administrations? He's clearly his... Uh, it's his personal relationship that goes back many years with uh, FDR and Churchill that stands him in good stead. Well, he knew Attlee quite well, of course, from the war, because Attlee had had uh, various uh, uh, appointments. He'd been, in fact, uh, Deputy Prime Minister of the Labour Party, been Dominion Secretary. King knew, knew Attlee uh, very well, so they had a good personal relationship from the uh, beginning. Even in a vague sort of way, approved of a lot of, uh, uh, of Attlee's uh, social reforms, so he thought he was going uh, too fast. Truman, he didn't know at all. And he never did have a very close relationship uh, with uh, Truman. It was a good relationship, uh, but it was never anything like uh, what it what had been uh, with uh, Roosevelt or, or, or what it was with Attlee and so on. He never knew him uh, that uh, uh, well. He never uh, stayed at the White House and had these late night uh, talks. But then, as I say, by the time Truman's administration was getting going, King was really sort of fading out in a sense. By 1946, he had given up uh, external relations, which meant all foreign policy for Canada within the uh, Commonwealth and foreign relations. So he still kept a close hand on it. But but he had good relations uh, with them. And of course, at the very end of the Second World War, within days of the defeat of Japan, uh, the big revelation was a Soviet atomic spy ring in Ottawa which he had to consult Truman and Attlee about, whether they were going to make this uh, public, what they were going to do about it. Uh, and he had a good relationship on that basis with them. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He'd been friends with the um, Russian, is it the Russian ambassador? I don't, I don't quite, I can't quite recall a story. Well, he had good relationships with the uh, Soviet uh, emissary, the first Canadian, uh, the first Soviet emissary to Canada in 1942, uh, 1943, Fedor uh, Gusev. Canada established uh, diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union, largely because of uh, trade. Canada was also supplying munitions and so on uh, to the uh, Soviet Union. Fedor Gusev, a man about whom hardly anything is known, was the first envoy to Canada uh, in 1942-43. And King went out of his way to have good relations with uh, Gusev. I mean, the Soviet Union was an important ally, was doing most of the fighting uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, he had high hopes uh, that it will be one of the partners in peace uh, after the war. What he didn't know, and I can't prove, it's my story and I'm sticking to it till somebody can come up with a better one, was that Gusev who set up uh, the spy network. The reason for that was because he had been a former member of the uh, Soviet secret police 
Uh, he held the rank of captain. And the other piece of evidence was within 10 months, uh, this low-ranking uh, sort of envoy was suddenly catapulted uh, from small post of Ottawa to be ambassador, Soviet ambassador, to London, where he undoubtedly also engaged with the British uh, spy rings and so on. And so how did somebody of uh, such insignificance become such a great uh, figure? He must have been doing something right. Uh, and it's my guess that he was setting up the spy network. He was obviously the person equipped to, to do it. And as I point out in the book, when King went to London in uh, the late 1945 to discuss uh, this spy relationship, uh, Gustav carefully invited him to lunch, ostensibly because they've been former neighbors, friends, and so on. Tried to plan with drink it and work, of course, with King. And though both, neither of them mentioned the spy network. They both knew what was going on. <laughs> and both were keeping uh, quiet about it. And at the end of lunch, as he was leaving the house, I mean, King made an appeal to Gustav. He said, look, we're old friends. We've got to keep this together. Uh, and, and, and in a sense, he was right. Unless the Soviet Union was supporting peace, then there was going to be another enormous problem. We know now, of course, uh, that it was inevitable. There was a, a total split. Uh, but even Churchill continued to hope uh, throughout, say, the rest of 1945, even as late as the Iron Curtain speech in March 1946, that perhaps the Soviet Union could be deterred uh, from its aggressive ways and brought to the path of freedom. Churchill continued to believe for a long time after the Second World War that Stalin was a moderate uh, who was being pushed along by aggressive people behind him. Uh, and that uh, Stalin handled right would bring the Soviet Union into the support of peace. I mean, we can see this is all a delusion, but this is what he thought. And it's what Roosevelt thought, too, before his death. What Roosevelt might have thought if he had lived on is a matter of much speculation and no one can tell. At the very least, he would have been very disappointed. But I think he would have tried and hoped, like Churchill, that somehow or if they could get together with Stalin, they could make it work. Because if they didn't make it work, then the situation was going to be terrible. And it was. It was the Cold War. But mercifully, the Cold War, despite some uh, narrow misses, never became a hot war. How much is King overlooked today? You know, I, I you know, from a British perspective, I don't think he ever gets a, a blooming look in. I suspect it's the same from the Americans. Is it the same in Canada? Yes. I mean, the, the story in Canada essentially is that the country fought the Second World War almost in spite of the prime minister. I mean, just sort of push him aside. It was, it was other people who made the decisions. The military leaders... Uh, the civil servants, and so on. And Canada had very good, confident people in it, but this isn't true. Without King's leadership, this would not have happened. To go back to the uh, uh, $4 billion in aid uh, to, uh, to, to the United Kingdom, I mean, if King had not been strongly in favor of this, this might not well not have happened. They might have given the loan, but that's a very different matter, isn't it, uh, from actually giving credits uh, for it and so on. And he had this relationship uh, with, uh, with with Churchill and Roosevelt, which enabled him to do this. Even at the Quebec conferences, or as I say, the conventional story, he was just there as a host, sort of hanging around, having his picture taken. So and he wasn't. He was involved in these discussions. And you can see it in his diaries. I mean, it's a uh, great detail. Anyone can read this, anyone in the world. These diaries are uh, available uh, on the internet, and because they are on the internet, I mean, you can search them by keyword. I mean, if you want to know, for example, anything about Mackenzie King and Montgomery, you just type in Montgomery, up it'll come. Or Alexander, uh, who became Governor General of Canada in 1946, you can find out all these sort of, so, so this a he was a huge a big diarist for decades kept a yes yes from from uh, student days as an undergraduate at the university of toronto uh, to within uh, a few days of his death uh, and so on they were uh, and we're to we're not talking a couple of lines he was no we're, we're talking of pages of 
typed. That's right. We're talking about seven and a half million words, 30,000 <laughs> typescript uh, pages, the equivalent of uh, 35 volumes of the third man. And the, one of the great things about this diary is it was never interfered with. I mean, King used it as an aid memoir. Uh, it was going to be the basis of his memoirs, and then it was going to be destroyed. Mercifully, it wasn't, but nobody has interfered with it. So these are not like the diaries, say, of Lord Moran, who was Churchill's uh, uh, physician. I mean, everybody uses these diaries, but how reliable they are, nobody knows, because he spent years after the Second World War rewriting the things. And indeed, he was always prying information out of Mackenzie King, who was also one of his patients uh, when he was in England, uh, prying out information, which he was adding to the diary. So these, in a sense, are more memoirs. They're not uh, sort of unadulterated diaries. Another example is the diaries of Chips Channon. I mean, the, uh, the first uh, volume, uh, complete volume, has now just been published in uh, Britain. These were heavily edited when they came out in 1967. Indeed, the editor never even saw the diaries. All uh, Robert Rose James, the editor, saw was a typescript which had been handed to him, uh, sort of uh, excerpts from the diaries. King's diaries are not like that at all. Neither he nor anyone else has interfered. These are exactly as they were written on those days, which makes them very unusual. And their, their length and detail must probably make them unique for a political leader. I don't know of anyone else who kept records like that. Well, it's the little things he put in where he, he comments on what people, the you know, health of Churchill, you know, he, oh, he, you know he, well, what his physical appearance is. And from that, he's judging on what his health is because he's always talking about being cherub like or something. You know, he's, you know, he's back with his baby face and looking full of vim and vigor kind of thing. Yeah, and the same, um, same, same with Roosevelt. I mean, this was uh, Roosevelt's physical condition, particularly in the last year of his life, was not only covered up at the time, but for many years after the Second World War, it was uh, heavily covered up, just how frail he was. And so if King's diaries had, on the subject had been published, even in the 60s with that level of detail, this would have been an astonishing thing. It's less astonishing now, but it's still important evidence. There's still chapter and verse there uh, of how uh, sort of frail Roosevelt was. But frail as he was, how he w would still have these quality of mind. And the same thing with Churchill. No matter how much he drank, there was still an astonishing Mind there. So you see both of these things in James' account. Uh, you don't just see one side of the picture, you see both. It's a well rounded account. It is absolutely fascinating. It really is. I really, really enjoyed your book. I really did. Um, it was a real pleasure because you get those very nice, uh, small tidbits of both leaders, yes. and, and you get you know, how central King really was yeah. to, to it's that yeah. thing where sometimes a good leader he doesn't isn't seen he just greases the uh the the the, the, the whatever it is you grease yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly yeah. it to, to make everything it? smoothly run and that's yes. what uh, king seems to do throughout the war yeah. just sort of bump everything along come that's up with exactly small it. solutions that's what i'm it, trying to convey Absolutely fascinating stuff. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. No, 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 no. The, pl the pleasure is all mine. Uh, I really enjoyed The Third Man uh, thoroughly. Th thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Loyal listener, if you have any interest in FDR and Churchill and want to view their relationship through a, a different prism than the usual Anglo-American point of view, Neville's book really is worth reading. The book is The Third Man. Churchill, Roosevelt, Mackenzie King and the untold friendships that won World War II. As ever, I will put a link on the website. Next time we'll be looking at a strange campaign where the British fought the French over the island of Madagascar in 1942. Until then, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. <laughs>